Thank you all for coming here uh, on Valentine's Day to hear about spiders. Uh, I hope that you'll, uh, you'll enjoy it. So um, let's see, where am I? Okay, so before I start, I'd just like to uh, thank some people. Um, my supervisors, uh, Dr. Andrade and Dr. Grease, who um, my current supervisor, Dr. Andrade, is at U of T, and um, Gerhard Grease was my master's supervisor at SFU, and I'm going to talk about a lot of the research that I did there, uh, along with collaborators. Um, and I'd particularly like to thank uh, Dr. Sean McCann, um, who's sitting here in the front, who <laughs> was the, um, any photos that you see in this presentation, unless otherwise indicated, um, were taken by him. Everything okay? <laughs> Great. Okay, so I'd like to start by telling you something that might uh, be surprising, and that is that sexual cannibalism is actually extremely rare in North American black widow spiders. So this is a, uh, a common misconception. Um, it's usually the first thing people think of when they think about black widows, um, probably partly in, due to the name uh, widow spiders. So uh, unlike their close relatives in the same genus, the Australian redback spider, um, in this species, males actively sacrifice themselves during copulation, uh, allowing the female to feast on their body uh, while they're transferring sperm in order to um, ensure that the female will, will have lots of his offspring. Um, so in that, in that species, sexual cannibalism is, is the norm. Um, but by the end of this talk, you'll learn uh, that in the North American black widows, uh, there may actually be a, a happier ending for both parties. So this is a, an outline of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, and we're going to start with Darwin. So uh, you may have um, known that Darwin's birthday was February 12th. So uh, today we have the opportunity to belatedly celebrate Darwin Day. And um, so I'd like to talk a bit about his uh, theory of evolution as a background to uh, what I'm going to talk about. So uh, Darwin published The Origin of Species in 1859 um, on uh, evolution by natural selection. And so as you'll recall, this is uh, natural selection is, is the mechanism um, by which evolution, gradual change um, in organisms over time can occur. So if you have variation in a population um, and that variation confers an advantage on certain individuals, allows them to survive and produce uh, and reproduce rather um, more than others that don't have those same traits, um, the traits that confer an advantage will be passed on to their offspring. And this is how change can, can occur over time. So this is what Darwin is probably most famous for. You think of Darwin, you think natural selection. Natural selection. Uh, but he didn't stop here. So um, Darwin was particularly vexed by the peacock's tail. Um, and after coming up with his ideas about natural selection, he had a, he had a problem. Um, he couldn't figure out how something so extravagant as a male peacock's tail um, could have evolved by natural selection. It doesn't seem to confer any survival advantage on the male. In fact, it's pretty unwieldy. Um, it makes it more difficult to fly and uh, makes the male more conspicuous. So he thought about this, um, but later he published uh, this book, The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex, um, in which he, he solved this apparent uh, problem. So you may or may not know that Darwin also came up with the idea of sexual selection. So this is what he wrote, and the, I've circled the main, the main idea here, which is that there are two kinds of sexual selection. So one between individuals of the same sex, uh, usually males, in which they are competing directly with one another um, in order to obtain matings with females. And then the second type is also between uh, individuals of the same sex. Again, it's usually the males. Um, and here, the competition is to impress females in order um, to charm them and be the one who uh, gets to mate with the female. 
So these are the two modes of sexual selection. The first is intrasexual selection, uh, usually male-male competition, where uh, males like this elk with his massive horns will directly fight with other males um, in order to gain mating opportunities. And then the other mode is intersexual selection, which solves the problem of the male peacock's tail. So here, um, the male, in spite of his cumbersome tail, um, is more beautiful than his rivals, and this will allow him um, to obtain matings and pass on um, his trait of having this elaborate and beautiful tail. So this is selection by female choice. So this, this sets the background um, for what I'm going to talk about from my own research on spider communication, because sexual selection is um, one mechanism by which animal signals and sexual signals in particular can evolve um, that allow males to do better than their rivals in securing mating and passing on their traits to their offspring. So let's change gears now and talk about spider communication. So with spiders, males have um, a particular problem. Not only do they have to convince a female that they are attractive and a good choice to mate with um, and compete with other males to get to the female and, and obtain those mating opportunities, uh, spiders are predators and um, they, they have no problem with eating other spiders. Here uh, this wolf spider is uh, eating um, not another wolf spider, but a ground spider in this case. Um, but they'll even eat other spiders of their own species. So a male spider not only has to impress a female um, with his quality, but he also has to uh, communicate to her that he is a potential mate rather than a meal. <laughs> so spiders communicate with one another in a number of ways, and these are a few examples. So um, web-building spiders are typically um, they typically have very poor vision, so they rely mainly on vibratory signals through their silk um, in order to detect prey and also uh, in order to communicate with other spiders. So here I'll show an example from the garden spider. So um, the female sits on her orb web and the male comes to her and begins an elaborate courtship dance on her web. He'd actually spin a special silk thread um, from the edge of the web to the center, and he'll pluck that thread and um, engage in vibratory behaviors on that thread um, to, uh, to woo the female. And eventually, he'll, he'll get up nice and close, like you see in this picture. Uh, here, the, the spiders are, are in an embrace. Um, but this has actually not gone very well for the male. You can see here, the female has started to wrap him up with silk. Um, <laughs> and uh, he, he has been eaten. So um, I show this partly because it's actually um, more common to, uh, that females will sexually cannibalize males um, in many other spider species than it is in black widows, actually. Most people aren't aware of that. So it's very common in these um, orb weavers. So this unlucky male was unsuccessful in convincing the female that he was uh, better to mate with than to eat. So um, the second example I'll talk about is uh, visual communication. So here we talked about peacocks already. This is the peacock spider with his um, extraordinary colors. And as you can see, these spiders have extremely large eyes. So unlike the web building spiders, they're visual predators. Um, and they, they can communicate with visual signals. So this is a, a video um, by Jurgen Otto, an arachnologist in Australia, um, showing the male peacock spider's courtship display. So he does this wonderful dance, um, waving his legs around, and he has this abdomen that's decorated just like a peacock's tail. And you can see here, now he's, he's vibrating his abdomen. So this is actually not only a visual display. Um, these spiders also communicate via vibrations. And so he's also um, vibrating his abdomen. And that's transmitting vibrations through the uh, stick that he's cording on to the female as well. And the female um, 
is in the, the position that you are, watching the male and judging him based on his dance. So that's the peacock spider. So if, if, you know, if you're arachnophobic, or if you know anyone who's arachnophobic, I highly recommend going on YouTube and searching for peacock spider. This is just one of um, tens of species of these beautiful little spiders, and they all have different decorations on their tails. They're incredibly beautiful. They're extremely tiny, only a couple meter, millimeters long, so they couldn't possibly scare anyone. Um, and if you watch their, um, their, the videos of their mating behavior, um, you can't help but fall in love with spiders, I think. Okay, and so finally, uh, chemical communication is what I'm most interested in. And um, the silk is uh, not only for vibrations, but also, it turns out, is a, uh, a substrate for chemical communication. Um, Oh, but I'm getting ahead of myself, sorry. So this is uh, an example of chemical communication in spiders. So this is a, a grass spider, Agilinopsis aperta. And in this species, the male does a courtship dance on the female's web. Um, so this includes vibratory communication as well. But he also produces a uh, pheromone, which has the effect of essentially knocking the female out, putting her into a sort of cataleptic, trance-like state. She'll actually fall over um, when he emits this pheromone, and then he'll sort of drag her around and get her in the right position to mate with her, and that's what's happening here. So this is the female's abdomen, and the male is up top um, and is copulating with her. Um, so this also seems to be a way in which the male can... Um, can protect himself from cannibalism by using this pheromone to um, make the female quiescent. So that's a, a bit about how the different ways that spiders can communicate with one another. Um, now let's talk about black widows, which are, of course, the best spiders. So hopefully you can see that better than I can. Yes, good. So this is a map of um, Canada and the US, and this is very... Um, a very rough um, picture of the distribution of the widow spiders, but the point here um, is that we have several species of widow spiders in North America. Um, the one that I study is the western black widow um, in British Columbia, but it goes all the way down to Texas and even into Mexico. Um, here in Ontario, we have the northern black widow, not in the city of Toronto, but north of Toronto, um, these spiders live. And then there are several other species um, in North America, including the brown widow, which is not native to North America, but is an invasive species. So the, the spider that I study, like I said, is the western black widow, so that'll be the focus for today. Um, so as you are probably aware, the female is uh, on the left, and you might be less familiar with the way the male um, who's on the right looks. Um, these spiders are incredibly abundant um, at my field site on Island View Beach on Vancouver Island in British Columbia. So this is where I spend my time in the summer studying these spiders. It's a beautiful beach covered with uh, driftwood logs. And under every single log on this beach, if you flip it over, um, you can find black widows. You probably can't see them in this picture, but under this log, which is probably about a meter long, that's me behind it, uh, we found 10 black widow spiders. So those are all of the individuals just living in this one, one log. Um, so they build tangle webs, three-dimensional, messy silk structures uh, underneath the logs on this beach um, at a high density, so about two or three females per meter squared of habitat, which is, is very, very dense. So it's a perfect place to study their behavior. Um, and I have to say, so, so people often say to me, like, that sounds like a terrifying place. I hope nobody ever goes there. But in fact, <laughs> um, it's a very popular beach. Um, we've met people who walk their dogs there every day and have for many, many years, and they have no idea that there are black widows on the beach. No one has ever been bitten there, and the black widows don't bother anyone. So during the day, they will hide out in crevices in the logs um, underneath away from the sun. These are nocturnal spiders. Um, and only at night will they come out onto their capture webs to hunt. So people never see them unless they're looking for them by flipping the logs over or watching them at night. 
So female black widows um, produce these beautiful silken egg sacs, which can contain um, up to a couple of hundred eggs in each one, and they can produce several egg sacs over the course of a summer. Uh, after a few weeks uh, inside of the egg sac, the spiderlings will start to emerge. And here you can see a little cute spiderling poking his head out. And uh, they soon build their own capture webs and are able to take down impressively large prey themselves and gradually grow up um, to become adult black widows. So this is what a uh, subadult or adult female would look like. Um, and once sh this one is um, sexually mature. So it, it, black widow spiders, um, like insects and other arthropods, in order to grow, they have to molt, and they go through several molts, um, and the females take longer than the males do, um, and they become larger and darker as they go. Uh, this is what a subadult male black widow looks like, and you can tell that he is about to be mature because of these little boxing glove-like structures in front of his face. Um, so he's one molt away from being sexually mature. This is what it looks like when he um, sheds his second last skin um, and develops these structures um, his pedipalps, which are what he uses to transfer sperm to the female. And I think, yeah, so I have a slide here. This is a little primer on spider genitalia. Um, and after this, you'll always be able to tell whether a spider is a male or a female, <laughs> which is useful information. So um, the female has an opening on her abdomen called an epigenum. Um, so this is a sclerotized hole. Um, and I'll show you later what the inside of it looks like, but that's where um, her sperm storage organs are. The male has this pair of appendages I mentioned already called pedipalps, um, which he uses to transfer sperm. So if you see a spider and uh, it has this large bulbous pair of appendages in front of its base, face. You can count the legs, there should be eight. And then if there are the two in front, which are sort of like hands, there are a, a fifth pair of uh, appendages that are used for handling food and sensing and things like that. Um, if they look like little boxing gloves, then you've got yourself a male spider. And if they don't, then it's probably a female or a juvenile. So. Once the male has um, undergone his final molt and developed these um, sperm transfer organs, he's not quite done. Um, in order to prepare for mating, uh, male spiders have to spin something called a sperm web. So they spin this special silk structure on their home web where they've been living their whole life. Um, and they uh, deposit seminal fluid onto the sperm web from an opening on their abdomen, um, just like the female has. So their, their gonads are also in the abdomen, and they have a genital opening in the same place as a female does. But they deposit their seminal fluid onto the sperm web, and then using their pedipalps, they suck the sperm up into those sperm transfer organs, kind of like little turkey basters. And so once those are charged up with sperm, then they're ready to go find a female uh, and mate with her. So this, spiders have very interesting sex lives, as I'm sure you've gathered already. So this male has now um, matured and, and charged up his pedipalps, and he's ready to go find a female. So this is where um, the love story starts. Um, the <laughs> sexual communication in black widows, which is, which is what I study. So, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, female black widows, it turns out, have attractive pheromones uh, on their silk. So these are essentially um, the web-based personal ads of the title. The silk has chemicals on it, that provide the male with information about things like how old the female is, whether or not she's already mated, uh, and even how hungry she is, which is important um, for males who don't want to end up as dinner. And so males, um, as they're searching for females, are able to detect these airborne chemicals being emitted from the female's webs um, and able to choose which female to visit based on what her personal ad is telling her. 
telling him, rather. And so um, in this species, males are actually choosy about, about who they want to mate with. Given a choice between a mated female and a virgin female, they'd rather choose a virgin um, because of something called first male sperm precedence. So the first male to deposit sperm in black widows um, will also be the first to father offspring. So um, if you mate with a female who's already mated, um, you might be the father of some of her offspring, but um, the first male will have an advantage. So it's much better um, to mate with a virgin female to ensure that more of your genetic material will be passed on. Uh, given a choice between a hungry female who's a little bit skinnier and a well-fed female, um, males would much rather wait mate with a well-fed female. So um, hungry females are smaller in size, which means they're not going to produce as many offspring. And they're also a greater risk of cannibalism. So I said before, cannibalism is really rare in this species. Um, it only happens if the female is really, really hungry. But luckily, males are able to detect whether a female is hungry or not. Um, and given a choice, they'll avoid a hungry female in favor of a, a well-fed one. So they won't often take that risk. So once a male has uh, caught a whiff of an attractive female, he'll traverse the beach on his way to her website. Uh, and eventually, once he arrives there, he will engage in a long and complex courtship display. And this can take several hours. So this is a video of um, one of the vibratory courtship behaviors that male black, widow, black widows um, perform uh, called abdomen vibrations. You can start to see now, if you watch his abdomen carefully, he's going to take a few steps um, and then he'll pause for a moment and he's vibrating his abdomen up and down. And so uh, my colleague Samantha Vibera and I did a study um, about black widow vibratory communication a few years ago, and we actually used a laser to measure um, the vibrations being transmitted through the web from the male to the female when the male does this. And we were able to compare those vibrations to the vibrations that are produced by prey, like crickets or flies, for example, caught in the web. Um, and what we think the male is doing with these very subtle abdomen vibrations is producing um, a signal that's very, very different from those of prey in order to uh, advertise to the female as soon as he arrives, look, I'm a male, please don't attack me. <laughs> so um, after he arrives on the web, he'll, he'll do abdomen vibration, he'll walk around plucking the threads of the web, um, pausing every once in a while to vibrate his abdomen. Sometimes if the female is hungry or aggressive, she will chase after him, but the males are really, really good at avoiding the female when she does that. So he'll just drop off the web and wait for her to settle down and then eventually climb back up and start courting again. And so uh, another thing that they do during this very long drawn out process uh, is a really, really intriguing behavior called web reduction. So what happens here is that the male starts to remove sections of the female's web. So this whole section, um, or this whole photograph rather, used to be a dense tangle of threads like this. And um, the male has gone around and, and cut them and bundled them up into a ball uh, and wrapped it with his own silk. So I'll show you a video of that, if it will work. Yes, so here you can see this um, web reduction in action. So the male is going to cut the silk threads and he's already bundled a large section of the web up in the center of the uh, screen and now you can see him pulling silk out of his spinnerets with his last pair of legs and he's wrapping that bundle of female silk up with his own silk. So this is a really fascinating behavior. As soon as I saw it, I, um, I became really intrigued um, and, uh, and this was actually the focus of my master's degree. So if you think about this um, male spider who's on a female's web, he's trying to convince her to mate with him, destroying her web, uh, which she relies on for prey capture uh, and defense, doesn't seem like the most obvious approach, right? So I was really interested in why the males are doing it and why the females are putting up with it. 
Um, and eventually, once they're done with this process, you'll often end up with a uh, big ball of the female's web um, like this, which the male has wrapped extensively with his own silk. So I had a couple of questions about web reduction behavior that, uh, that I and uh, colleagues addressed during my master's degree. So the first one is what triggers it? Why do males start doing this? Um, because not all males, in fact, do it. Um, only some of them do. But it happens most of the time. Um, and the other one is uh, what is the function of this behavior? So first, what's the trigger? So we already knew before I started my um, research that when a male first makes contact with the silk of the female, um, he immediately begins courting, even if the female isn't on the web. So that was evidence that there's a pheromone on the silk um, that is triggering courtship once the male makes contact with it. Um, and this research in 1979 um, showed that males have um, tiny little hairs. This, this is on the tip of their legs, so on their feet, basically. These tiny little hairs which um, look like they are contact chemoreceptors. So when these make contact with chemical com compounds, um, the male is able to um, taste them or smell them. So the idea is um, now that pheromones on the silk are responsible for eliciting web reduction behavior in, the, in particular. So to find out if this was true, um, we had female black widows spin webs on glass frames in the laboratory that looked like this. We collected the silk, uh, and then we extracted it in methanol. And so the idea here is um, if you put the silk into this solvent um, and leave it for a while, any compounds on the silk will uh, be extracted into the liquid. And then if you take that liquid off, you'll just be left with whatever chemicals were associated with the silk, but not the structure of the silk itself. And then we tested males' responses to this um, in an experiment where we had a T-shaped setup with a treatment stimulus on one side and a control on the other. So in the first experiment, we had silk on one side and nothing on the other, just plain paper. And then in the second, we had um, the silk extract, so just the methanol that had, um, had the silk soaking in it and then solvent alone on the other side. So we released male spiders at the bottom of this T allowed them to climb up to the top, and then we recorded what they did. And we looked at how long they spent on either side and, um, and their behavior. So first, we looked at whether they spent more time on the treatment or not. And so this graph just shows the difference between the time they spent on the treatment versus the control. So you can see up here that males spent 40% more time on silk than blank paper, um, and likewise, they spent 40% more time on approximately on the silk extract than on the solvent alone. So what this told us is that um, the chemicals associated with the silk are sufficient to elicit the very same behavior. So this is evidence for a contact pheromone that's responsible. Um, sorry, in this case, they're just as interested in the, um, the extract as they are in the silk itself. It's not the structure of the silk that's required. The second thing we saw was that males would wrap the silk um, if we put it on the uh, filter paper in very much the same way as they wrap a female's web. So when you put female silk on this little filter paper so you don't have the structure of the web anymore, the male will still um, wrap it just like he would if he was um, wrapping up that bundle of female silk like we saw in the other video. And this is just a slow motion replay because it's really cool. Again, you can see him pulling the silk out of his spinnerets. So what we saw here is a very similar result that um, when we looked at the silk extract, it was um, just about as effective as the actual silk at eliciting this um, web reduction behavior, specifically the silk wrapping. So. This told us, um, sorry, that there is in fact um, a pheromone on the silk, and we did additional tests um, using analytical chemistry to uh, see what the compounds were on the silk, 
um, and we found this is one of the compounds um, that's responsible for this behavior. So we know now what is responsible for triggering web reduction behavior. But we still don't know what it's for. Why are males doing this? So to answer that question, we did a field experiment. Um, and we asked, we hypothesized that it might be that by reducing the web, um, making the area of the web which has attractive pheromones on it smaller and wrapping it up with silk, the males that might actually be reducing the attractiveness of the web. So to look at this, we went to the, we designed an experiment um, with four different treatments. So we compared uh, an intact web, a web that had been reduced by a male, so this has had some of the silk um, removed and wrapped with the male's own silk, and usually it's about 50% of the web, give or take, sometimes it's more, but sometimes it's less. On average, they'll remove about 50% of the silk. And then we had a third treatment where we removed half of the silk entirely. So the idea here was to look at whether it is a reduction of the total area of the web that would be responsible for reducing attractiveness, or in the case of the, uh, the male reduced web, he's reduced the area of the web, but he's also added a whole lot of his own silk, and that might be important. And then finally, we had empty controls. So we um, put females into um, cages in the field, um, allowed them, sorry, we had, we had females build webs in the laboratory in these uh, mesh cages, and then we uh, removed the females so that we would only be looking at the effect of the silk inside of the cage. And we had these four treatments. I'm sorry, my slides are a little bit out of order here. So. We had cages with webs in them. Some of, some of them were empty. The other three kinds were these three treatments that I explained before. And um, we surrounded the cages with, with this sticky material so that any males that, would be, that were attracted to the airborne pheromones being released from the web, um, as they walked towards the silk inside, they would have to walk across the sticky glue um, and get stuck and we would be able to count the number of males that were attracted to each web. So we set up the experiment on the beach that I showed you before um, with each of the four treatments um, in a block like this. And we had 20 different um, sets of four cages all along the beach where these spiders live which looks like that. <laughs> and um, we put the cages out just before dusk and left them out for 24 hours. Um, and what we found was that just within the first few hours of the experiment, um, the intact webs in particular had attracted a whole lot of males. So this is just one female. And here you can see more than 10 males um, were captured outside of her web just after a few hours. So this um, personal ad that's being released from the silk is extremely attractive, um, and this, the number of males arriving outside of this web suggests that competition among these males for access to females is very fierce. So the first male to arrive is going to have an advantage um, over the others. And so this is the results of our experiment. This is literally the data that we collected. <laughs> um, all of the males that were captured. And so what we can see here is that um, over our 20 sets of four cages, we taught a, caught a total of 105 web, uh, males outside of the intact webs. Um, and a few less, 83, outside of the reduced, the scissor reduced web. So these are the ones where we've got half of the silk removed entirely. Um, so that's a little bit lower, but statistically, those are no different. So removing half of the silk um, didn't make the web any less attractive. 
than an entire web. But when you look at the male reduced webs, they captured only about a third as many spiders as the intact webs. So this tells us that whatever the male is doing, if he destroys the web when he first arrived, arrives, um, that's significantly decreasing the attractiveness of that female, and it's going to reduce the number of other males that arrive and compete with him for access to the female. And that can be important because, as I mentioned, um, these males are courting for several hours before they manage to uh, mate with the female, so they don't want anyone interrupting. And uh, I'll just mention that those, those poor six males that ended up in the no web controls um, probably got caught by accident walking over those sticky strips on their way to an attractive female's web. So um, we've now determined that the function of web reduction is to decrease competition. Males are able to make the female less attractive, ruin her personal ad, um, and... Um, and this helps them to avoid competition with rival males. So he's not done yet, though. This web reduction all takes place during the first bit of um, the courtship display on the female's web. But he hasn't even interacted with the female yet. And the name of the game is um, mating and um, reproducing. So what happens next? Eventually the male is able to approach the female and he now spins silk all over her body. So you can see here the female's legs are covered in silk and you can see some uh, silk over uh, her abdomen as well. So he spends a long time courting on and around the female, wrapping her up in this bridal veil, arachnologists call it. Um, <laughs> How so romantic. Um, <laughs> and so um, this is another thing that I'm really interested in. We haven't determined yet what the function of this um, silk wrapping is, um, but this is something I'm studying for my PhD currently. And um, what I think might be going on is, um, is that the silk that he is wrapping around the female's legs in particular um, might be full of pheromones. Uh, that are providing the female with information about the male or possibly putting her into a sort of quiescent state, uh, similar to the function of that pheromone I mentioned earlier that knocks the female out. In black widows, they don't fall over, um, but they do enter a sort of passive um, trance-like state before copulation where they don't move for a long period of time. And so it's possible that the function of this silk wrapping is for the male to transmit pheromones uh, directly to her contact chemoreceptors, which are mostly concentrated on the ends of her legs. Um, I should say, though, that um, this, this bridal veil behavior is not unique to black widows. It occurs in quite a few other spider species as well. Um, and historically, some arachnologists thought that the, the function was to physically restrain the female, that this is spider bondage. He's wrapping the female up in silk so that she can't move. Um, and this is unlikely to be the case because um, if you watch Black Widows, even if a fe female is wrapped up in silk like this, um, if she decides to, she can start moving really quickly and, and um, throw the silk aside quite easily. So that's probably not the function of this, although some people have argued that the second or so that it takes her to get free could give the male an opportunity to escape a cannibalistic female. That's a possibility. Um, finally, once he's wrapped the female up, um, the male eventually is able to copulate. And this is the money shot of the male um, transferring sperm with his left pedipalp. And you can see this is part of his um, pedipalp that's sort of like an inflatable balloon that he uses to pump sperm into the female's uh, sperm storage organ. So, and he's got two pedipalps, so he can copulate twice. Um, he's got two batches of sperm. And the female has two um, corresponding genital openings. So this is where we get back to the cool spider genitalia. These are, this is a close-up of the male's pedipalps, and um, they have a spiral-shaped organ called an embolus, which is what actually transfers the sperm. And uh, this bit on the end is important. It's called the apical sclerite, and it breaks off really easily um, 
at this point here. So the male has these corkscrew-shaped sperm transfer organs, and the female has correspondingly corkscrew-shaped um, genital openings, a pair of them. So this, this is a corkscrew, and then this is the, the spermatheca, which is where the sperm is stored. And what happens is if the, fe if the male um, can place his apical sclerite just so inside of the female sperm storage organs, um, they'll break off when he removes his pedipalps and actually block access to other males. So this, these are called mating plugs, and if the male um, is able to place them correctly, even if the female mates a second time with another male, that male won't be able to, to successfully inseminate the female. So this is another way that males can um, win out over rivals in um, the competition for mating success. Um, as it happens, though, males aren't always really great at doing this. So sometimes they'll, they'll break, their apical sclerite will break off, but it'll break off somewhere else, and it won't be um, successful at preventing other males from copulating. So they've got a number of strategies um, that they're using to, to win at the game of um, competition. Um, and so as we've seen, they first are reducing the female's web to prevent other rivals from arriving and mating with them, and um, interrupting them, rather. Once they succeed in copulating with the female, they can deposit these uh, mating plugs so that subsequent males, even if they do manage to mate, um, won't be able to successfully inseminate the female. And then even after that, um, it turns out that once the female rebuilds her destroyed web, um, if she's been mated, she no longer produces pheromones. So she'll spin a new web that's no longer attractive to other males. So the male can go off happily knowing that the female um, remains unattractive to other males. Uh, so once he has mated, he can uh, go off on a second journey um, towards another attractive female. And uh, as, you'll, as you've seen, um, in most cases, the male does in fact survive. Like I said, sexual um, cannibalism only occurs if the female was really hungry. Uh, and in most cases, both spiders do live more or less happily ever after. Thank you. <laughs>